Guys, thanks for coming tonight. I'm so grateful that you are here. You are the greatest ministers of this church. You make the biggest difference. We leave this place as we leave every time and say, you know what, we're going out into a world, we're gonna make a difference. But these moments matter. And I'm so grateful to once again have an opportunity to introduce my friends. Some of you don't know Dan Seaborn. A lot of you have been around the church for a length of time. You know that he, he's spoken here for years now. He is one of the greatest sources of wisdom and encouragement to my life. I've known him a long time since my college days. And he is a very consistent man when it comes to his relationship with Jesus, his family. He runs an organization, founded an organization at Winning at Home. He's been a pastor. He's a gifted communicator. You honestly don't know who you have on this platform, all the places that he has spoken. But he's my friend. He's a friend of our church. And if you don't know him, you're going to know him. You're going to love him like all of us do. Give it up for Dan Seaborn, everybody. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I love you, Dan. Well, kind. Thank you, Brent. Those are kind words. I, uh, I come tonight as the most broken among us. The only reason I have hope, the only reason I make it through the day, the only reason I got here is because of Jesus. And I give all glory, all praise, all to him. He's been so good to me through all my crap, through all my struggles, through all my weakness. And tonight, that's what I get to talk about. I can hardly believe this. I come down here, you know, Brian asked me if I'd come and jumped on a plane this morning. I've been up since 2.30, so if I say a couple of words backwards, you just forgive me. <laughs> but I jumped on a plane, came down, and, you know, I just watched you arrive in the parking lot an hour early. <laughs> God's just doing something really cool here. That you can't, it's like, it's not man-made. You know, I know there's got a lot of personality, everybody has fun, etc. But when God touches something, there's just a desire to be here. Like, like none of y'all are here tonight going, come on, let's get it over. You're here, well, there might be a teen or something, the parents. <laughs> yeah, my parents used to make me come, but, but I, I would say even to you, be open to what the Spirit's going to say. Have an open heart. You've had a great week so far. Let me just say a couple of words about the people who have spoken so far. Phil Lewis, yesterday, he runs the Tampa Bay office of Winning at Home. He's my partner, and I'm so proud of him, so thankful for him, so thankful for the heritage him and Brent have together. But he brought the word last night, and he pointed you to a man named Jesus. And then before that, and I, I just want to tell you, all I travel the country, okay? I was in Ohio last week, and then Jane and I will be in North Carolina. I mean, I'm, I'm traveling all over the country. I'm just going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you all something. You guys get to hear the name of Jesus spoken boldly, spoken clearly. Brent doesn't beat around the bush. I tell him, you don't, you don't need to necessarily call us a revival. Y'all have a revival every week. And... Pastor Brent preaches as strong as anybody in this country. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Our country right now is in chaos. And when there's clarity presented in chaos, it just stands out. And I'm just going to tell y'all, y'all need to build a church or something because they ain't going to hold <laughs> what's coming. What's coming. You know, as I travel around, preachers say to me, what, what do you think churches need to be doing? I'm just like, seriously, you got to ask me that question. Preach the name of Jesus. Our society, our society is so hungry. And maybe you're here tonight and you don't know the name of Jesus. And you go, oh, they brought this guy and he's going to say Jesus. Yes, I'm going to say Jesus because you don't need to know my name. You need to know his name. And you need to know him personally. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Because we're living in chaos. I sat in my office the other day. I, I was going to go speak at a corporation. I got invited to speak at a corporation. I talk about how to balance your family life and your work. And so this corporation is like 1,200 people. So they brought me in. They said, Dan, speak to this crowd. And so I, I thought, what are these people feeling? They, they don't know I'm a preacher. It's kind of sneaky. <laughs> and I thought, what are these people feeling? They were, it's a six-day work week for them. They work 48 to 60 hours a week, a lot of the employees there. It's crazy. They make food. 
So it's a really busy industry. During COVID, they've doubled down. They're making so much frozen food, it's crazy. So they're looking for people to work. So I thought, what are these people feeling? What are they, like, I'm going to speak to them. What are they dealing with on the inside? So I sit in my office and I started making a list of all the things in our society right now that's causing people chaos. I just sat at my desk and started making a list of what I see, just looking and observing because I'm thinking, that's what they're feeling. And I want to speak to that. So I started writing down where people in our society right now are disagreeing, okay? And I'm going to list it off for you. Now, you might be on one side or the other. These I'm not here to pick a side. I'm just going to tell you where I see people arguing. Let me just give you an example. Vaccines. I, I don't want to start something. I'm just trying to show you that out there... Like, look, let me do it this way. I spoke at a church. I spoke at a church. I had a pastor's wife up, come up to me after I spoke at this church. She, I had finished speaking. I poured it out. I talked about Jesus. She pulled me to the side, and she said, where do you stand on the vaccines? And I was like, oh, oh, shoot. <laughs> you don't know how to answer it. If somebody walks up to you at Walmart and says, where do you stand on vaccines? You just kind of look at them like... I, I, I got to look for something. You know what I mean? I don't want to answer this question. And I said it, and my answer was not correct. And she proceeded to tell me straight out of God's word how wrong I was, how what I was teaching, how can you dare say that? How can you? I mean, she went off on me so much so that, this is, this is humorous, she went off on me for over five minutes. And her husband was standing right over there, like 20 feet away, going, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm like, sorry, get over here and get your wife. Don't be sorry. Come get her. The world. And she, do, you, do you see where Scripture stands with me on this, et cetera? I, I just started going, yes, bless you. Bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Car, please, Car. She stood there. I went to another church. I had somebody come up to me, ask me the same question. I thought, 50, 50, 50, 50. I'm going to go with the opposite of what I said to her. Said it, wrong answer. Started telling me scripture about why that view was exactly wrong. There will be people in hell over this, etc. And I'm standing there going the whole time going, Look, 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 both of them use scripture. Both of them said they're God-fearing people. And I, I stepped back and I went, okay, that one's there willing to die for it. That one's there willing to die for it. And I'm sitting here going, somebody's not right. <laughs> I don't preach vaccines. I preach Jesus and him crucified. Don't come up and ask me after. <laughs> I don't answer anymore. I just say whatever Brent says. <laughs> That's just the first one. Mask. It's crazy. Political views. I mean, it. It's getting hot and heavy. This election is going to be a home dinger. <laughs> and people on both sides believe they are so right. Sometimes I, sometimes I wonder what would happen if all the effort and energy Christian people put into politics would put that same effort and energy into evangelizing for the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. Kids' schooling issues. I, again, I'm just thinking about the 1,200 people I'm about to speak to. Kids' schooling issues. I'm just going to go down the list. Uh, how, how offensive you can say something and you offend oh, the whole world. Something comes out of your mouth and you're like, ah! <laughs> Sexual identity issues. 
I've ne- I've, I'm 61. I've never lived at a time where I remember the list being this long. There's always been issues, right? But it's like now we're kind of looking for, hey, look, hey, I found an issue under the rock. Found another issue. It's crazy. To me, just my personal opinion, it's what happens when God's spirit begins to be pulled away. There's chaos, see? Because we've said to God, don't want you anymore. Don't want you in school. Don't want you here. Don't want you here. And God says, okay. I'll let you see what chaos looks like if you want to. Climate change. (laughs) You guys should have a good view of that one. (laughs) Inflation. How much should I be on social media? Kids' screen time. Some of y'all have a kid right now. They, they love screens, man. You to, even to get them off when you got to. We're at church. Lay it down. We got to go in for an hour. Then you can get it again. I know what it's like. Gender equality issues. Everybody's got to always be the same. Race, ethnicity issues. Lack of knowing if there really is truth. I'm, I'm just saying, I thought about this list. I thought about this list. Because whether y'all see it or not, and whether you can understand it or not about yourself, I'm sure you can, it affects you. Because it's all around you. People who say, oh, that stuff, it doesn't even bother me. Yeah, yeah, it does, because we're watching it all the time. And let me say something else. So are our children. Children are watching, and they're thinking this. Are there any adults in the room? Because the the people who call themselves adults that you tend to see on TV, they don't look real mature. They don't speak mature. They speak with fear and worry and anxiety. And you got to know, one of the greatest things that children deal with when they're small is anxiety. Our phone at Winning at Home right now is ringing off the hook. Guess who? Five to 18 year olds don't know where to go. Can we please talk with a counselor? Can we please talk with a coach? And I'll bet you that's true here too. And what happens in that process? Nobody in this room sets out to get their life all awry. We don't wake up in the morning and go, How could I screw up? We don't do that. <laughs> but life and society throws that at us, and all of a sudden we go, How'd I get here? It's like, I think I told you this before. I grew up on a farm, and I remember watching Grandpa's cows. Um, Saw some cows as I was landing today, and I thought about this. The cows, Grandpa would milk them and let them out of the barn in the morning, and and cows just kind of, they start nibbling. You know, they they don't look up. They nibble over here, nibble over there. You guys might remember me telling you this before. I watched these cows nibble, and then they they get out here, and they, they keep nibbling. You know, 30 minutes, they nibble, and all of a sudden, they look up, and they're like, where's the barn? Where's, where'd that barn go? And then, oh, there it is. It's kind of like shocking. And I call it, they, they nibble their way to lostness. That's what we do. Nobody sets out to go, I'm going to get lost. But we nibble. See, we get our head down. We look at the things. That, oh, there's something to argue about. Oh, there's a little something to fight about. Oh, there's something over there. And all of a sudden we go, how did I get here? And I would tell you right now, I look at our society and I go, how did we get here? This isn't new either. The Israelites did this a lot. And I was reading in my devotions, and I just happened across this verse I want to read you. This is, this is the psalmist David is speaking, and he's, he's given a little bit of a history of the Israelites. And he says this at Horeb. Now, the Israelites, I gotta go, these are God's people. God did miracles, crazy stuff. They would pile up stones to go, remember what he did here? And everybody would have said, we'll never forget this. At Horeb, these Israelites, they made a calf out of cast iron and worshipped it. L- listen to the line here. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of a bull that eats grass. In other words, it would be like me going, oh, man, 
these guitars. <laughs> and I never really realized how beautiful they are. Hey, everybody, look over here. I, I know we once served God, but wow, look at the wood on that. And I think Willie Nelson touched it. <laughs> and wow, and oh, look, oh, oh, wow. If I said to y'all tonight, hey, we're going to start worshiping that guitar, you would go, what? Because you worship the one true God here, see? And you know that's not God. That's just a stinking guitar. The God of this universe is so great. And, and the Israelites just kind of, they, they didn't start out there. If you'd gone up to a group of Israelites who were seeing God's amazing miracles and say, hey, one day you're like, your great grandkid is going to worship a, a cast iron bull. They said, no, they want. Yeah, they do. Because we slowly nibble at things that pull us away from God. So i got to take you back to Matthew 6.33. I want to read this verse to you. It's coming up on the screen. It says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first his kingdom. You can put anything there. Look, there's a lot of people seeking guitars. There's a lot of people seeking this stuff. And God says to us, Seek me first. And then all the other things, all the other things after you seek him and his righteousness, then all the other things will be given to you. But we get those other things in the wrong place, and tonight I'm going to tell you why. And I'm going to use my own life. You guys know that I'm a pretty open book. I'll tell you, I'm an imperfect man. I have my weaknesses. I talk about them. I spoke to the Lord about that on the plane today. I was just like, Lord, I've never done this. I want to read you something. I, I was on the plane, and I felt like the Lord began to talk to me today. Just in my spirit, I heard no audible voice. There were not turtle doves going through the cabin. <laughs> I just felt like the Lord began to talk to me, and I, 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 just, I just said to him, Lord, I, I want you to do it. Lord, I read I'm a new creation. This is what I, I wrote this today. I, I was not planning on reading this. You guys might think I am, those of you joining online, so glad you're with me. If you think I set this up, I didn't. It just comes to my mind. I'm, I'm just being real, real open with you. Lord, the Bible says I'm a new creation. Why do I still have so many struggles? I wrote today, this morning on the plane. Why do, Lord, why do I have so many struggles? Why can't I just become the new creation and never have these faults and failures in my life again? Dan, you are new every morning. Your willingness to surrender each day to me, that is the new creation. The old you didn't care to grow. You're seeking to grow every day. You're fallen. You're human. What's this line the Lord gave me today? Christ was from heaven, you are not. That helped me. <laughs> you were born of earth. I see your struggles. I see your human side clearly. You're willing to be honest. You're willing to surrender. You're seeking to be true to the calling I've given you. A broken, fallen dude is trying my best to seek first his kingdom. I mess it up sometimes. I don't do it right. And I'm going to show you why I struggled with this for so long. Because I want to leave two points with you tonight. They're very simple. Here's the first one coming up on the screen. Very simple point. I want you tonight to be certain of how much God loves you. Now, look, I, if you can leave it up there for just a minute for me. What is that? Four, five, eight words. And most of you would look at that and go, I got it. No, you don't. No, you don't. I've been discovering this right here. From uh, Some of you do. Got it, got it. But I'm just saying the average person in here, you need to know you are not certain of how much God loves you. And I'm going to tell you why. 
Many of you are going to relate to this. Growing up, I fought so hard to get my father to think I was valuable. I've talked about that with you before. I would do anything to get his approval. And I never got it. He died three, four months ago with COVID. We healed. We're good. I hugged him, kissed him as he died. We are awesome. We finished wonderful. But growing up, I craved him to love me. And so I, I couldn't see. I didn't see this as a little boy. I didn't realize I was kind of seeing my dad as my God figure. And I wanted him to love me. And he just, he just never showed it. I'm, I'm sure he loved me. Don't get me wrong. But he never showed it. I would mow the grass. Dan, mow the grass. Okay, Dad, mow the grass. I'd get as perfect as I could. And he would come out and go, oh, you did a good job. But, oh, right over here, you missed the play. Oh. It's never measured up. Not realizing, oh, my goodness. This is shaping how I feel about how God loves me. So I transferred what my dad was doing. I transferred it right to God going, I'll never measure up. I'll never be good enough. My dad, I think I've told you this, but my dad, right up to my dying day, like if I come here to Pathways and I, it, when he was alive and I go back home and go visit him at the nursing home, I kept him really close to where I lived there and I go see him. Dad, how you doing? Good. Where you been? Pathways down in the one I go to, you know, down in Tennessee. Are they willing to hire you or you have to keep traveling around the country? <laughs> you know, the first few years, it was hard on me. Toward the end, I got to where I just played along with it. Yeah, they won't hire me. <laughs> Were you making enough money to, to make a living? I'm squeezing by there. You got any extra? <laughs> you know, I just... <laughs> Let's go ahead and work that last couple of bucks out there. <laughs> Never measured up. Boy, for, for the first many years of my ministry, it ate at me. And, and I would always think, man, I'd preach, and I'd walk off stage and go, God, I don't think I did a good job for you. Because I'm tying it to my dad. So many of you in here, when I say, are you certain God loves you, you have this link in your mind. You shouldn't, but you have this link in your mind tied to someone in your past who you did not measure up to. And you saw them as an authority and a figure the same way you view God. And you don't think they're good enough. And then after 21 years of being with Dad, I, I, I moved that over to Jane. And then I wanted her approval. And I wanted to make her happy. And if I ever let her down, I'd be like, oh. We tie so much of how we feel about ourselves before God Almighty with how people feel about us. We don't even see it. But you need to know tonight, I want you to be certain that God loves you. You don't... I, this is what I've come to realize in the last three, four years. Watch this. If I never speak again, if I never preach again, God straight up loves me. Why does he love me? I'm his kid. He made me and looks down and goes, hey, my boy. None of you, <laughs> none of you, when your child was born and, and you were waiting there in the hospital room and you're, you're the dad like me, I actually was in there with Jane. When that baby's born, the doctor says, here, hold it. You don't take it and go, mm, let me think if I love this little frick. <laughs> I don't know. Shoot, no. As soon as that little baby's born, you're like, oh, there's something that just, you don't even know how to explain it. It's like, you better step back. This is it. And then I remember when the second one was born, I thought, I remember going in the bedroom. Alan was two or three, and I went in his bedroom, and, and he was sleeping, and Jane's really close to giving birth to Josh. That will be our second one. And I remember crying, going, I'll never love another kid like this. This next one's going to come, and he's going to get half love. <laughs> and he was born, and instantly, oh, baby. Equal love for this little sucker. 
Then there came a girl, same thing, maybe even a little extra. And then there came another girl. <laughs> That's you to God. He looks right down at you right now and goes, oh, look, look, look. Be certain. I did not create you to not love you. I love you because I love you. And somebody here tonight been through a horrible marriage. You're a teen and you're not getting that affirmation. You, uh, you're older, never got it from your spouse that passed. Or in, 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 when I say, I want you to know and be certain God loves you, everything inside you wants to, but you're going, I don't know. Tonight is a night for you to be done with that. The, I, I, I'm just telling you, it's just true. God loves you. You, you say, Dan, I'm broken. I just read to you on the phone, God, I'm, I, I, I still struggle. I mean, I'm a preacher. I'm 61 years old. I, I travel all over the country and preach, and I've got failures and faults. And God goes, I love you. But I'm broken. I love you. But I'm messed up, and I love you. Why? Because you're my kid. You're his kid. Our world's broken right now because they don't know God loves them. They're trying to find the answer in somebody or something. In fact, another list in my mind of, of all the things that we try to use to fill that spot. And I said this at the corporation the other day. I said, y'all need to know you're God's kid. But you've tried to replace and fill that God spot in your life, that, that thing that he made that only he can fill in you. You've tried to fill it with all kinds of stuff. And I said, we've got a list of stuff. Relationships addictions and some dude about halfway back yelled out I got mine and I went bro what is it what's your thing that fills your hole and he said he said alcohol <laughs> fills me up you know workplace and I went bro you made my point it fills you up at night and then you're really empty in the morning because everything on this man-made list, you get done with it and you feel even more empty. And there's some of you in the room, you're, you're still young enough that you've only used half the list so far. You're like, oh, Dan, I, I, I kind of hear what you're saying, but you look, you look near death. I'm still young. <laughs> I've gone through these things, but I've got a plethora of things here I'm going to go through. I would tell you, go up to somebody here that's 80 tonight that's been through the whole list and save yourself some pain. <laughs> because you'll get right here to the very end and add even your new one. And when you finish, you'll go, why do I still feel empty? Because nothing satisfies the God spot in your life like God. And some of you here tonight have put something else in that spot. And I'm telling you, you got to stop. You will never be satisfied. You guys do realize where you live, right? You realize that when you go down the street here, there's a lot of things that say, try this one out. Number one, it's the greatest, best show you've ever seen. Can't believe how good this is. This is amazing. Meet the people here. <laughs> and you go to the show and you're like, well, that was okay. <laughs> but it didn't fill my spot. Because man-made things can't do what God can do. Amen. Jesus is the pocket filler. And I want you tonight to understand, simple as I can say it, be certain. But before you leave here tonight, understand, whether you fully get it or not, do not leave here saying, God doesn't care about me. 
Now, I want to talk about that a second because a lot of people think, well, if I go through a hard time, if you're, if, you're very, if you're shallow in God and shallow in the Lord and you go through hard times, you actually blame God for that. You go through something really hard and, and you're like, see, somebody has said this in the last week. God doesn't, God doesn't love me like he loves all those other people. Look over there. They're all winning and getting good stuff and I'm over here struggling. He doesn't care about me. I actually propose to you, you actually are at a place where you can sense and feel his deepest love. I don't usually feel my real, real closeness to God on the tops of the highs of the mountains. I feel it in my deepest quagmires. Because man-made stuff won't stay with you there, and God does. I was sitting the other day at a table, three guys, okay? Okay. Another pastor, me, and another guy here, and this guy here said, I just feel like, you know, I feel like God doesn't bless me sometimes. He, he just he, he, he gives me hard stuff. I, I don't know. I, I just think God's against me. And this pastor, he did not know this. The pastor looked at him and said, so my 10-year-old son, I just found out, has leukemia. Are you telling me God doesn't love me? And this guy on the other, no, 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 I wouldn't try to say that. He said, because right now, God is the one who is loving me the deepest. So today, for somebody here who is hurting, be certain. God loves you right now. You say, how, do, how can I know that? Let's put it this way. I'm just an old broken vessel, but if you're here tonight and you're really hurting, I'll give you a hug after. Because I've been through some crap. And when you're in crap, you just need a hug. And if I'm willing to do that, how much greater your creator is. And then, after you realize and you're certain of how much God loves you, then secondly, second point, I want you to be certain of how much you love him. Get that? So first, God loves you. Then I want you to understand, you got to love him back. That's what this revival's about. And I want to talk to you what that looks like. So for me, um, one of the ways I do that is I spend time in his word. Um, I want to talk about that a second. Uh, when, I, when I was a pastor on staff at a church, our, our lead pastor said to us one year, hey, and for those of you who do this, it's awesome. Go for it, et cetera. But he said to us, all right, staff, I want all of us to read through the Bible this year. So everybody, I'm going to give you a daily guide to reading through the Bible. That's a fairly large book. And he said, I'm going to give you, th- and I want each of you to check it off and come report to me each week. I did it. I want to tell you I did it. Oh, my word. That was the longest year of my life. <laughs> you say, Dan, you're a pastor. I know. But that thing when you wake up in the morning and you look over and you, oh, my word, I got to read six chapters in Lumentations. I mean, it's, it's, this is going to be hard to do. I did it. I did it. I checked it off. I was able to report. Yes, sir. Did, it. did you do it? Yes, sir. <laughs> Don't ask me questions because I'll fail the test. But yes, sir. <laughs> I wasn't good with tests anyway. You know those big questions they would ask like on the SAT? If two trains are going 360 miles an hour and one's going four miles and one's going two miles, how long before they run into each other? I remember going, I remember one time writing E going, who cares? I mean, I just, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> they should not be going that fast. I mean, it's just come on. So, so I, I remember after that, you know, I felt guilty. I felt guilty. Like, I'm a pastor. I can't report that I don't enjoy this. But I was not connecting with God. I was not. And I want to say this tonight very clearly. When I say You're certain God loves you. Be certain you love him. Find the way that you connect with God the Father. So I'm going to show you what happened for me. I decided the the Bible says the word of God is alive. I would not have described that you're reading it as that. I actually would tell you it was painful. So I was like, Lord, I I don't know what's wrong with me, but you got to help me. He gave me this idea. And I'm going to show you what I did. I took and I started in the book of Psalm. And I started reading one verse a day. 
You can read through the Bible in three lifetimes. <laughs> I went to Psalm 1-1. I'm going to show you what I did. I went to Psalm 1-1. And I, I decided I was going to do Psalm and Proverbs. Let me find the end of Proverbs because I'm going to show you something. I decided I was going to read through Psalm and Proverbs. And I was going to read one verse a day, starting with Psalm 1-1. And here's what I was going to do. I'm going to read it till I see that verse come alive during the course of my day in my life. I'm out shopping. I'm in the car. I'm driving. When I see that verse come alive, like the meaning of it, I just go, oh, wow, that's what that means. Lord, I'm going to stay with that verse, and I'm going to read that verse. And if it doesn't come alive today, I'm going to read that same verse in the morning. I did a verse until it came alive. Seven years. <laughs> Took me seven years. But I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just going to tell you all right now. I started loving reading the Bible. Because it spoke to me. And you, you know what? L let me just show you something, okay? God loves it when he sees his kids wanting to know him better. Like anybody in the room, if you, if you have a teen, anybody ever have a teenager, if they ever walk into the kitchen and it's just a mess and they say, Mom, this kitchen's a mess, how can I help? <laughs> After you get up off the floor. Well, that's what God saw me reading his word and went, Oh, I see my boy. You're loving me back. Yeah, God, and you're speaking to me. Yeah, Dan, this is how we connect. Those of you who read the Bible through every year, I'm proud of you. That's, that's how you connect. It just didn't work for me. And here's what I see most people doing. Ready? Most people look and go, I just don't understand. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't know what it means. What? Most of you have right now somewhere close to you, one of these. When you're on it and your texts start not working and your emails aren't working or something happens, you don't say, I don't understand it. You don't do that. You don't lay it down and go, I'm never using that again. It doesn't speak to me. I'm done with that. That's a waste of my time. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is precious. We call our friends. Hey, do you know what settings means? Do you know if I've got an iPhone 1 or is this a 23? <laughs> and if that doesn't work, you go into the store, you drive and wait in traffic to get to the store to say to them, can you fix this? I'll pay you $1,000. <laughs> and your Bible sitting at home going, will you give me that kind of time? Will you give me that kind of effort? I... I, I what if I got on the plane? When I got on the plane today, I noticed when I was walking all the way back, I was sitting in row 18. Every person I passed. What if I passed everybody and they were going, oh man, how different would our world be? Is God certain you love him? Or would he say you might love this more? Is it on your list of things that distract you from him? Based on that, I probably will get through the Bible. Might not make it. But, but I'm going I'm I'm to say this. I don't read the Bible to get through it. I read the Bible for it to get through me. And this revival is not about what Jesus owes you it's about what you owe him and somebody tonight is not certain of his love I want you to be certain tonight and then I want you to commit yourself to spending time with him lay this down sometimes 
and pick this up. I don't understand it. No excuse anymore. You understand things you want to understand. So I speak peace over you. I speak God's anointing over you in terms of saying I want you to seek Jesus. So tonight, we're going to come out, we're going to sing, Oh, Come to the Altar. It's the revival song. If the Lord has spoken to you, I'm just going to ask you to come stand along the front. You say, Dan, I'm going to do that. You're coming up for one of two reasons. Oh, my goodness, he loves me more than I thought. Come up here to just be reminded of his great love. It's not, it's not about coming forward, but it's a public confession of, oh, my goodness, Jesus, I got that out of whack. I come to you. Or come because you're going to let him know you're certain you love him. So would you stand with me? Father God, we stand together praying for your anointing over us. We're weak people, fallen, broken, humble, in need of a Savior. Thank you, Lord, for a church where we can say the name of Jesus boldly. Inspire us tonight to come and lay it all before you. They're going to start to sing. As they start to sing, I just invite you to come. Stand along the front. If the aisles fill up, I'm anticipating you coming. If the Lord has spoken to you, walk to the front. Kneel, stand. Let's come to the altar and give ourselves freshly to Jesus.